Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining. On today's episode, we're going to be looking at the passive income account. This is my dividend growth portfolio. The current value is around 220000 And we're going to be looking specifically at the top three holdings. Because overall, I have it organized into different sectors and different categories that I'm invested in. And I have holdings in each of these categories. But only three companies make up 30% of my portfolio. My top three positions make up 30%. It's JP Morgan, Apple, and Disney. Those are my three biggest investments, and we're going to be talking about them on today's show. Each of them has some news. For instance, JP Morgan has Jamie Dimon, the CEO, saying in his annual shareholder letter that he sees a potential Goldilocks moment for the United States economy. And he thinks that the stimulus, infrastructure, the vaccines could all culminate to an economic boom for the next three years. So Jamie Dimon has turned pretty bullish on the stock market over the next three years. We're going to look in further detail on his remarks. For Apple, we have Tim Cook going on to the podcast Sway from the New York Times, and he talks about his competition with Netflix, how Apple competes with Netflix, and he also talks somewhat indirectly about the Apple car. This is something that we haven't seen Apple really officially say anything about, but we know that they're working on an Apple car, and Tim Cook has asked about it on this podcast. And then last but not least, we have Disney, my third largest holding. Now, we know that they're working on an exclusive Wakanda series. This is new news for Disney that they're coming out with a Wakanda series for Disney+. Plus. And then Disney has also released their first full-length trailer for the series Loki. This is another exclusive Marvel series going on Disney+. Plus. So we'll be looking at this trailer. I'll be giving you my thoughts on what this means for the future of Disney. So we have a lot to get into, a lot to cover. And like I said, JP Morgan, Apple, and Disney, these three companies alone make up a huge portion of my portfolio. They make up over 30% of the value of my portfolio. And I've been very bullish in the past about all three of these companies. I've made multiple videos on each of them. For instance, with Disney, I have six videos on a playlist on my YouTube channel just dedicated to Disney and why I was so bullish on this company. And likewise for JP Morgan and Apple. I made multiple videos on them. I've been very bullish and so far they've performed very well. For instance, Disney, my third largest holding, now has a value of around $22,000 and the gains are $4,800 currently. Apple, my second largest holding, has a value of $24,200. The gains are $7,500. So a lot of this position comes from gains. And then JP Morgan, which has now grown into my largest position, has a value of $25,600 and 7,400 of it is gains. So this again is another one that's done really well so far. So with each of these investments doing so well, the question is, what do I do with them now? Do I take profits and invest in different companies? Do I just hold and not really touch them? Or do I double down and continue investing in these great companies? We're going to be looking at that and I'll give you my answer in this episode. Now, before we jump into all of that, I first have to give a shout out to all the Patreon members. We've had a ton of new people join over the past couple of weeks. If you're interested in that, there's a link in the description. It's patreon.com slash Joseph Carlson. You can join now and try it out. You get access to a lot of different things like a Discord community of investors, as well as different websites and tools like this, this dividend tracking spreadsheet that shows you a lot of information about your portfolio, your dividend income, the breakdown, upcoming dividends. A lot of this data is drawn and dynamic dynamically. So you just put your portfolio in and it builds out all these beautiful visuals of your portfolio. So if you're interested in that, there's a link in the description. You can try it out for free. All right, let's go ahead and jump right in. The first company I want to talk about is Apple, which is my second largest holding. This is the technology hardware software company. The reason that I bet so heavily on Apple last year, my thesis for it, my bull case for Apple was that they're a great company. They make great devices. I really like the phones and different devices that they make. I think they do a good job with it, but they're a home run business. They come out with these phones once a year. Hopefully they do good. And that's gonna make it so that they're more risky because they're a home run business. Well, Apple decided that they're gonna change that. They're gonna transition from a home run business to a subscription and software service business. And that software, that residual income, the monthly income month over month makes it so that they have a much more stable income. And if Apple has both the software and the hardware, and they have those services every single month, along with their iPhones on top of it, I think this company was going to have a multiple expansion. That was my thesis for Apple, and that did play out that way. I own 187 shares of Apple, and I bought it when the average share price was $92. So that was the price that I bought it on average. So to put that on a graph, this is what it looks like. That's my buy price, 
And this is where we are right now. So it's up about 40%, not including dividends from where I bought it. So the return so far has been very good. The question is, is how is Apple doing right now? What does their future look like with their current price of being $129 a share? Now, Tim Cook recently went on to a podcast where he was asked about a variety of different subjects. He was asked about things like their battle with Facebook over privacy. But one of the main subjects that was brought up was Apple's push into services, specifically content creation. Uh, what about um, content? You're in content. Why do you think you need to be in there competing against a Netflix? It seems like it's a comma for you, like a, hardly any investment. Oh, no, no, not at all. Not, not at all. We're making serious investments in Apple TV+. Plus. I assume you're talking about video content. Yep. Mm -hmm. Do you hear her question? What about content? Isn't this kind of just like a side thing for you? You know, it's just a comma. It's not really a big push for you. And Tim Cook's taken aback by that question. He's saying, no, not at all. This is a huge push for us. We're making serious investments into content. The reason that Tim Cook was so taken aback by this question is because he knows that the new direction for Apple, the new goal for them is to grow their services, grow their residual subscription income. They don't want to rely specifically on their hardware. So moving into content is not some small sideshow for Apple. It's their big push right now. This is the future direction of Apple. She thinks that because right now, it probably doesn't make up a lot of the bottom line for Apple, that it's not a big deal. This is the same thing that everybody says about any initial push into content. Well, Disney's not going to make a lot of money from Disney Plus because it's only $6 a month. They only have 50 million subscribers. That's not going to be a big deal. But it's the biggest deal for Disney. The push into content and the push into subscriptions is the most meaningful part of these big companies' direction. From Disney to Apple, this is the new future for them. So Tim Cook knows the importance of this, even if the host asking the question does not. For the same reason that we're in products, we're about making the best, not the most. He says, like with our products, we're in the business of making the best, not the most. And he's talking about the Apple TV Plus library. He thinks that they have some of the best TV shows, even if they don't have a big library. Now, I know what Netflix's response to this would be. I know what Reed Hastings would say in response to Tim Cook's claim here of we're focused on making the best, not the most. Reed Hastings would say... That's what everybody says when they don't have a big library. They're focused on quality, not quantity. But then when you grow a big library, you're going to say you're focused on your catalog and variety of choices and appealing to different audiences. So he would say that Apple's just in the phase right now that they don't have a big library to boast about. So they have to say they're focused on quality. But once they transition into a big library, now they're going to say they're focused on a catalog, on appealing to different demographics and having lots of different content. So I'm sure that would be Netflix's response. Now, Tim Cook also gets asked directly about their competition between them and Netflix and HBO Max. And so in the in the TV Plus area, we're about originals, only on Apple. And so I don't know if, if you're watching uh, what you're watching at all. The morning show, just on yours. You're watching all. the morning show. I hope you love it. Ted Lasso. I don't know if you've watched Ted Lasso. I have. But there was no better show during covid I'm getting notes from a lot of different people right. that love how, it. How do you compete, though, against a Netflix? And you've got all these streamers. All HBO Max is making all this content. You have money. That's what you have the most of, I think, compared to all of them. So she's saying the way that you're going to compete is you have deep pockets. You can just keep affording content. His response is a little bit different. And I actually think that Tim Cook is correct here. His response, I think, is correct. Hopefully we have good ideas. But Kara, I don't see it as a zero-sum game. I, I don't see that if a given user buys Netflix, that they can't also buy Apple. And you think content is critical as an area of focus for Apple? Yes. And we're putting all of ourselves into it. It is not a hobby. It is not a dip your toe in. Because it's an original focus, we don't instantly have a catalog with, you know, 500 things in it. We're going to build over time. We've gotten over 300 nominations now for awards and have won mm -hmm. 80. I, of course, think that Tim Cook is correct here. I think that Apple TV Plus really is not competing so much with Netflix or Disney Plus or HBO Max. I think that all these streaming services will likely be successful to a certain degree. I think the top three are going to be Netflix, Disney, and HBO. I think that those are the ones that have the most compelling content, the biggest libraries, and they already have a foothold into the streaming world. So I think those will be the biggest ones. But I think the Apple TV Plus and Amazon Prime will also be very successful. They'll be very good value adds to Apple. And like he says, 
He reiterates how important Apple TV Plus and content is to Apple's future growth plans. It's not a sideline thing for them. It's a big push, something that they're very much focused on. And then next up, we finally get to the Apple car. Tim Cook is asked about it directly. I like that this interviewer puts him on the spot about it. Last question in innovation, a self-driving cars. One of the companies requires Drive AI, a self-driving startup. Apple's testing autonomous vehicles. It was, reportedly. Last year, Elon Musk said he offered to sell Tesla to Apple for one-tenth its value, and he said you wouldn't even take a meeting with him. You know, I've never spoken to Elon, uh, although I have great admiration and respect for the company he's built. I think Tesla is uh, has done an unbelievable job of not only establishing the lead, but keeping the lead for such a long period of time in in the EV space. This was something that was reported by Elon Musk saying that he wanted to sell his company to Apple and they wouldn't even take a meeting and it was for a tenth the price it was. Kind of saying, look at how dumb Apple is. But this could be said for a lot of different companies that Apple didn't invest in or didn't buy. Many of them grow into big companies. Apple's very disciplined with their pocketbook. They don't go out on a spending spree and buy any company that they're excited about. And you know what happens when different companies do that. Sometimes you can buy the the Tesla, which turns out to be a great investment. Other times you can buy the DirecTV, which turns out to not be such a great investment. So I like the fact that Apple tries to retain as much cash as possible, and they try to build out products from the ground up themselves, because usually that means that they have a more integrated product base rather than buying a bunch of different random companies and then trying to duct tape it to their company. A lot of times that doesn't turn out as cohesive of a product, and Apple's all about having really good integration. So I think the criticism of Apple not buying Tesla is completely 2020 hindsight. If anybody could see the future, of course Apple would probably buy Tesla back in the day, but that's 2020 hindsight. Tim Cook goes on to talk kind of openly about an autonomous vehicle. So he talks about it as if they're not making one, but it kind of it kind of sounds like Apple's working on it, or at least he's he's been thinking about this for a long time. Just look at the way that he talks about a potential Apple car. In terms of the work that we're doing there, obviously I'm gonna be a little coy on that. The autonomy itself is a core technology, in my view. If you sort of step back, the car in a lot of ways is a robot. Yep. An autonomous car is a robot. Mm-hmm. And, and so there's lots of things you can do with, a, with autonomy, and we'll see what Apple does. So he says, we'll see what Apple does. That's kind of the teaser. We'll see what Apple does with this. In my opinion, it sounds at least like they're heavily considering this, probably working on it and trying to make sure that it's viable and it's a good direction for Apple. We investigate so many things internally. Mm-hmm. Many of them never see the light of day. I'm not saying that one will not. Would it be in the form of a car or the technology within a car? I Yeah, I, I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> I think it has to be a car. You can't just do the tech. You're not going to let, you're not Google. <laughs> we love to integrate hardware, software, and services and find the intersection points of those because we think that's where the magic occurs. She says, if you build out the AI software, the autonomous driving, are you also going to do it with a car? Like, are you going to integrate the hardware with the software? And he says, well, I'm not going to answer that, right? I'm not going to give an answer. But then he says, well, we like meeting software and hardware together. That's the core of Apple. That's where the magic happens, which means, yes, if we do this, we're going to actually build the car. We're going to build the software. We're going to own the whole thing vertically integrated, similar to how Tesla's doing it. So I think that down the road, it's a good chance that Apple's going to be a big competitor to Tesla. So back to the same question, is Apple a sell, a hold, or a buy? I definitely don't think that Apple's a sell. I think it's a mistake to sell your shares in Apple, um, even if it goes up a little bit. I think you hold on to Apple because it's such a tough company to get back into if you sell out of. If you sell out of it, the chances are that it's going to race up in price, and then you're going to be buying in at a higher share price. So I think you hang on to your shares, and you buy more of them on any dip. If we look at the recent chart here, Apple's been hovering around 130, 120. It's gone up to as much as 134. So anywhere where it goes down a little bit, you can pick up some more shares of it. And I think that Apple is going to continue to trade 
in the high 20 PE ratio from 25 to 30. I think that's the range it's going to be trading at. So try to buy it anytime you get the opportunity. This company still has a tremendous amount of potential to grow. We have autonomous driving. We have all of its services. We have things with artificial intelligence and augmented reality. Apple has a lot of things they're working on, and I see a lot of future growth in this company. Now, next up in my portfolio, we have JP Morgan. It's in my fintech and banking section. This is a company that I was buying into during 2020 when a lot of people didn't want anything to do with banks. They thought you were crazy if you owned banks, but looking at the actual numbers, banks like JP Morgan had more than enough reserves, even if the economy didn't do well. Even if we had lots of loan losses, lots of issues, JP Morgan still would have survived. But since the economy is doing okay, they're thriving and they have a lot of money left over from all the money they put aside in case they had loan losses. So JP Morgan's a company that went from the single digit PE ratio to now 14 PE and their net income over time, even though it dipped during the worst part of 2020, it started to regain rapidly. And last quarter, they gained $12 billion in net income. That's a highly profitable company. So JP Morgan, according to its books, balance sheet, according to its income, is doing fantastic. The company's in very good shape. And Jamie Dimon, the CEO, has also become a lot more bullish and optimistic about the economy in general. In his annual shareholder letter, he says that expanded vaccine distribution and the Biden administration's proposed $2.3 trillion infrastructure plan could lead to an economic Goldilocks moment, where we have fast, sustained growth alongside inflation and interest rates that drift upwards slowly. So this is what he's expecting for the future. All this economic stimulus and spending is going to spur the economy for at least the next couple of years, and we'll see inflation and some interest rates move upwards as well. He says that we'll need to fund this through raising taxes taxes, but we shouldn't raise corporate taxes too much because it will make it so we're not competitive with the rest of the world. And the Wall Street Journal also notes that banks like JP Morgan, they tend to benefit from periods of economic growth and they would welcome a boom to the economy. So this is what we're seeing with JP Morgan. In 2020, during the coronavirus, it sold off like crazy, nearly down 40% from its highs. Many investors sold out of the company because they had thoughts of it being like 2007 when many of the banks went out of business and investors lost all of their money in the banks. Well, I looked at the situation and saw that JP Morgan had plenty of money, plenty of reserves for loan losses. They weren't going to go out of business. So I started buying this company aggressively when the price was heavily depressed. And then since then, it's raced up like crazy in share price, going up over 50%. In fact, over the past year, this company's up 63% not including dividends, which it has been paying dividends this entire time. So this has been one of the best investments. But right now, with my holding of JP Morgan, I don't plan on adding more to it. We're now seeing enthusiasm being priced into it. People want to own banks now. They're excited to buy them. The outlook is rosy and green. And this is when I decide to stop buying. I think there's companies that have more depressed share values that I think I can get a better value on. So I stopped buying JP Morgan. I now have it as a hold. I'm not going to be selling it, but I'm not going to be adding to this position unless I see people sell out of it or become scared again, or they're less enthusiastic about the future. Because right now I can take the money I want to invest and invest in other sectors I think don't have as much excitement priced into them. Now, next up, of course, we have Disney. Disney is the largest holding in my consumer pie. The current value is 22,000 and about 5,000 of that is gained. So this company has done really well for me so far. The question is, what are they up to now? The latest news that we've heard from Disney is that they now have a new Wakanda series for Disney+. Plus. This is the advantage that Disney has. They have such a robust library of great content with Lucasfilms, the Marvel films, Pixar, Disney Animation Studios. They have so many different things working for them already that they don't have to come up with brand new ideas and take huge risks. They can just draw from their already huge asset base. Their already huge library of well-loved content. And they're now doing that with this new Wakanda series. The series is part of a new multi-year overall television deal with Ryan Coogler, who of course was the director and co-wrote the Marvel film Black Panther. So they took the director of Black Panther, and not only do they have him working on a sequel to the movie, but they also have him directing a multi-year television deal. So this is an ongoing relationship. Disney has locked down the director that will build out the entire Wakanda universe on Disney+. And I think that this is going to be another huge hit for Disney. This is going to be something else that pushes this service to the next level. I'm so bullish on Disney+. Plus. I think it will be, if not the biggest streaming service in the world surpassing Netflix, I think it will be at least in the top three. 
And Disney Plus also has their new Loki series. This is another exclusive for Disney Plus. This is being released June 11th. I want to watch some of this trailer with you. The timekeepers have built quite the circus. And I see the clowns are playing their parts to perfection. Big metaphor guy. I love it. Makes you sound super smart. I am smart. I know. Okay. Okay. Please sign to verify this is everything you've ever said. This is absurd. Sign this too. We protect the proper flow of time. You picked up the Tesseract breaking reality. I want you to help us fix it. Why me? I need your unique Loki perspective. Do I get a weapon? Nah. You really believe in this Loki variant? Luckily, he believes in himself enough for the both of us. Why? It is adorable that you think you could possibly manipulate me. I'm 10 steps ahead of you. You're not big on trust, are you? You can trust me. Loki, I've studied almost every moment of your entire life. You've literally stabbed people in the back like 50 times. Why never do it again? That's it. That's the new trailer for Loki. Now, whether or not you're a Marvel Universe fan, whether or not that's your type of specific thing that appeals to you, you have to admit that this is high quality content. This is movie-like content in different TV series that appeal to millions of people. Disney is knocking this out of the park. Series after series, big hit after big hit, exclusive series that are going to appeal to millions of people. These type of series... This type of content is how you gain millions and millions of new subscribers every single month. And Disney has been knocking it out of the park with every series they're doing. The Mandalorian was the first one. An 8.8 .8 rating on IMDb, that is very difficult to accomplish. There's not a lot of series that are able to do that. But Mandalorian was one of the best series in 2020, created by Jon Favreau. It gave new light and new breath to the Star Wars universe, and it really drew a lot of people to Disney+. Plus. And then we have Falcon and the Winter Soldier. This is a brand new series, and so far it's been well received, 7.9. That is a great rating. A lot of series do not get these high ratings. And WandaVision, this is another series that has an 8.1 rating by IMDb. Again, this is in the top tier, the top percentile of TV series on all of IMDb and their exclusive series on Disney+. And then with the addition of Loki, I think that Disney has in their hands another big hit. I think it's going to be another big draw to the Disney Plus service. So this is a situation that Disney's in, just to give it some context and perspective. Over the past year and a half, one and a half years, they grew a streaming service from nothing, zero subscribers, to over 100 million subscribers. It took Netflix a decade to get to 200 million. This is the power of content. Disney has all these extremely high level, movie quality, unique content that no other company can compete with. They have a more robust library, it has broad appeal, and they can continue to draw from that to gain more and more subscribers. So even though companies like Netflix will continue to grow and HBO Max will continue to grow, Disney has a unique advantage over the rest of them. They have consistent cash flow to fund new content creation, and they have a massive library library to draw from. I still remain bullish on Disney. This is a company that I'm going to be buying more and more of because I want more of it in my portfolio, even at today's price point. Now I know it's difficult to justify buying Disney at its current share price because you look at the graph and over the past year, it's up 85% in price. That's a huge price increase. But if we look at a bigger picture, Disney actually hasn't gone up that much over the past five years. In fact, let's go ahead and compare that to the S&P 500. They've performed pretty much in line with each other. 
Disney hasn't massively outperformed SPY. It's basically in line with it right now. And I think there's a lot of future growth still not priced into Disney. So I'm gonna be buying more of this company even at today's share price in the 180s. I think that it's still a good buy and I think the company will still continue to do well. When I look at all the big companies trying to get into content creation, trying to grow their streaming service, they're frantically trying to get into this industry. And I think that Disney already knows the recipe. They already have the content lined up, this exclusive high quality content that's movie-esque. I think that they're gonna dominate this new streaming world. So I think that Disney is still a good bet even with today's price point and I plan on increasing my position. So there you have it. There's an update on my portfolio and the three largest holdings. I'll be buying Apple on any big dip, any pullback, I'll buy that company. JP Morgan is a hold right now. It's gone up in price so much that I plan on holding it, collecting the dividends. And then I plan on buying Disney even at today's share price because I'm still so bullish on that company. If you want to see my other holdings and other bets that I have, there's a link in the description. It's called my portfolio, my dividend portfolio. You can click on that link and you can view any of these categories, any single company in them. So you can click on that link and it will show you my target allocation for every single holding. I hope this video was helpful. If you enjoyed it, click the like button. Other than that, I'll talk to you guys next time.